Okay, thank you everyone. I appreciate the invitation to come here today and uh, speak to you. Um, it's been a wonderful trip this last week and I'm excited as always to present our data um, and I hope that I can present it uh, slow enough in a way that um, it's understandable since I'm speaking the foreign language today. So um, this work and, and all the work that we've done in the last few years um, is really a very nice collaborative effort between um, our colleagues at the National Cancer Institute and, and the, at the Cleveland Clinic. Um, really without, uh, as, as Jonas mentioned, Frank Rossetti is really the father of human retroviruses, having discovered the first one and, and now really the third one and being the first to isolate those. Um, we work very closely in this project with his wife Sandy Rossetti and um, it is really a testimony of, this, of the success of this project to the value of basic research to our society because Sandy Rossetti has worked on this murine, this mouse family of viruses for um, almost 40 years. Um, and, and without that work and without the reagent she developed and the knowledge that she developed, we wouldn't have been able to do this. And our government closed this um, mouse uh, virus cancer program probably about 15 years ago but Sandy Rossetti saved all the reagents and of course had the knowledge enabling us to do this. I should mention also that she uh, is going through a program review today which is a review of her program to get funding to continue this work. She had actually retired a year ago because she was finished and was going to retire to the beach but when she saw this she realized we needed the help, so she's um, agreed to take on five more years and help us. So um, I'm going to go a little bit backwards and introduce to you um, the uh, schematic, really, of what a retrovirus particle looks like um, and schematically. And retroviruses are envelope viruses. Um, the envelope proteins, the surface unit, the transmembrane domain, Main, um, are in a lipid bilayer that is formed when the virus exits the cell, and I'll show you that on the EM a little bit later. But that surrounds and really protects the core of the virus, which contains two copies of a RNA genome. So they're called retroviruses because our genomes are made up of DNA, and these viruses are made up of RNA, and they need these enzymes to first reverse transcribe right backwards the RNA into DNA so that it can insert itself into the chromosome and, and then um, live forever in your cells and your DNA. So the virus has also, in order to protect its nucleic acids, um, proteins known as GAG. It has envelopes, uh, uh, envelope, as I mentioned, um, polymerase and other um, enzymes that enable it to replicate well. So. The identification, as Jonas mentioned briefly, of this novel gamma retrovirus, and we'll talk about that in a lot of detail in prostate tumors, um, was made by um, Bob Silverman um, in collaboration with this group here, because Bob is an immunologist and he recognized that men with familial prostate cancer, that is a lot of prostate cancer in the family, um, usually the men get it very young and it's very aggressive, um, was, was correlated, strongly correlated, with an in, a, a defect in the RNA-cell antiviral pathway. And many of you might know that RNA-cell dysregulation is a problem, a major immunological problem in chronic fatigue syndrome. But what they did was they took um, uh, nucleic acids from the men with the prostate cancer and they put it on a viral chip looking for novel viruses that these um, men might have um, been susceptible to because of that defect. And so this chip has um, all known um, virus families and it has nucleic acid sequences about 72 bases such that you can capture um, quite specifically um, um, the sequences of viruses in the genomes of these men. And when they did that, they found uh, this sequence light up in all of the men with the RNA cell defect, which is about 10% of the general population. Um, and when they sequenced that, 
they found that those sequences were most closely related but not identical to uh, the xenotropic murine leukemia virus, which of course is a gamma retrovirus. So because they were closely related but not identical to that, um, Bob named the virus um, xenotropic MLV related virus or XMRV. So it's related to but not identical. So what we knew, what we knew about the virus, what we know about it now essentially is, um, as we mentioned earlier, how it got into humans <coughs> is unclear. Um, it's known as a simple retrovirus because it makes only the structural genes, the gag, the pol, and the envelope. Um, the envelope gene is very highly related to the envelope gene of the spleen focus forming virus family. And that family of viruses, the envelope is both an oncogene causes cancer and a neurotoxin. So this infection with this family of viruses in animals is associated with neurological disease, neurogenerative disease, and, and aggressive leukemias. So it's not an endogenous virus, but it's very highly related, though not identical, as I mentioned, to the sequences in inbred and wild mice. Importantly, because Bob Silverman found the virus integrated in human tissue that he was studying, it showed it was a human infection and not, not some kind of contamination or piece of virus, but actually integrated into the human um, genome. So importantly, the LTR of a virus, the long terminal repeat, is the on-off switch, particularly of a gamma retrovirus. And the, they, uh, Steve Goff and Bob Silverman learned that the on-off switch of the uh, XMRV virus is only three things. Two glucocorticoid response elements and an NF-kappa B site. Well, what does that mean? Well, glucocorticoid response elements respond to hormones, to androgens and estrogens. So the strongest one in this virus responds to androgens and estrogens. And the second, which is weaker, um, responds to the stress hormone cortisol. So cortisol is the main stress hormone. So naturally, when they associate the onset of CFS with situations of high stress, one could simply hypothesize that's because you turned on the expression and made many more copies of the virus at that time, eliciting inflammation or some kind of uh, uh, immune response and, and eliciting the clinical symptoms. So that, that also makes sense when we hypothesize XMRV um, in um, human disease. So these are the human retroviruses that exist. There are only three families of human retroviruses. We all know HIV, HTLV is human T lymphotropic virus. That means it favors infection of, of T lymphocytes. And both of these viruses, which were discovered in 80 and 82 respectively, are complex retroviruses because they make these accessory proteins that, that go away and act, transact on other genes in your immune system. So that they cause disease and their expression is, is um, uh, regulated by these proteins and, and that, that can add to the complexity of the virus and the disease. Where, while as I mentioned, XMRV is a simple retrovirus controlled almost exclusively by the on-off switch and the envelope as perhaps the pathogenic um, moiety there. So, um, how do we detect human retroviruses clinically? So we have essentially 30 years experience detecting HIV and HTLV1, and we detect them first by looking for antibodies to viral proteins in the blood. So once the cell is expressing virus um, in, a, in a human being, they should make antibodies to that because that is the job of, of your immune system. You can, you can do a technique called a Western blot where you actually um, block proteins from the infected cells and probe them with antibodies that are targeting gag, envelope, or other genes. You can also look for the DNA provirus integrated into the cell, and that's done today by uh, PCR uh, amplification of, of, of DNA or RNA. The RNA would be in the virion, and they told you there were two copies uh, of RNA. So you, you may be more sensitive to look for virion RNA as well as 
um, integrated provirus and look at all by um, PCR um, in order, to get, especially in low copy viruses such as uh, XMRV is. And finally, in order to um, show that a virus is in, indeed um, associated with disease, you have to isolate it from the disease and not from normal. So these are the very simple and, and um, very old um, techniques that we use to isolate this virus. So I don't have to belabor MECFS. Um, we all know that it's a neuroimmune disease of unknown etiology, and we heard a lot um, from Barbara about the, the symptoms. Um, importantly, the evidence that we thought of, and I'm, I'm not a CFS research scientist, I'm a retroviral immunologist and cancer researcher, but, but when I see a disease that may be caused by a virus, I saw evidence that some individuals develop these symptoms after a prolonged flu-like illness. And acute, and, or flu-like illness is the um, acute stage of HIV infection and HTLV-1 infection. Importantly, clusters of CFS. That's areas where there are outbreaks, if you will, of CFS. The one in Incline Village, in, in Lindenville, New York, in London, in Los Angeles, Florida, that are the ones I know of. So those clusters where you'll get an outbreak of a disease suggest an environmental trigger, a pathogen, or, or some other chemical or environmental trigger. Um, and finally, as I mentioned, we know that uh, CFS is associated strongly uh, shown by Kenny DeMurlier, um, Bob Sedolnik, um, even Vinnie Lombardi as, as a major immune defect in these patients. So that allowed us to make the link to prostate cancer because we knew about the RNA cell work of Bob Silverman as we were collaborating with him for many years um, in drug development. So we simply asked, is XMRV associated with CFS? So that is the work that resulted in the publication last year in Science. Um, and what we did was we obtained peripheral blood from individuals with CFS, including sites of previous clusters, that of, of Incline Village. We used the methods that I just explained to you, uh, methods previously used, the PCR that Bob Silverman used to detect XMRV in prostate tissue, but we used the novel methods for detecting anti-XMRV anti antibodies in the blood of these patients, as well as isolation of infectious virus. So when we did that, we detected evidence of XMRV infection in 67%, really minimum, of the CFS patients out of the 101 in this study. And importantly, we found uh, evidence of XMRV infection in 4% of normal blood donors. And in, in the United States, that would represent 10 million Americans. And that would indeed be the um, highest incidence of the human retrovirus in the United States. Um, so these are the assays that we use to detect and isolate XMRV. So what we do, um, in order to isolate a virus, you have to have the cell divide to produce the virus because it uses all the cellular machinery to get that integrated provirus to, to come out, reverse transcribe, package, and leave the cell. So we chose this cell line, LNCAP. Usually one would do an exhaustive search for cell lines to grow virus, and we got quite lucky in this because I had used it in drug development for many years, and I knew that it came from the lymph node of a man with an aggressive prostate cancer, but it was responsive to androgens, had a defect in type 1 interferons, alpha and beta interferon, and a defect in RNA cell. So I hypothesized or guessed, and actually guessed right, that this would produce high levels of XMRV, and in fact, it's the only cell line anyone's identified so far that does. So it's, it's increased or given us the ability to detect the virus, but you have to culture the low-level virus from the dividing cells or the plasmid, sometimes as long as 42 days. So um, um, uh, almost uh, a month and a half to actually do this culture and then isolate the viral proteins, run them out on a gel electrophoresis, you'll see the surface unit using this monoclonal antibody that is specific to the spleen focus forming virus envelope, which I mentioned was a polytropic xenotropic virus and, and a neurotoxin. So this, this, this 
Um, antibody very sensitively recognized the surface unit of X uh, MRV, suggesting how closely related these viruses were. And it also could detect matrix protein here, um, known as P30 and GAG P68. So, so using this technique then, we can detect um, virus and actually isolate virus, and I'll show you, but it takes a long time and is quite labor intensive.